Good morning. My talk is on our African Indigenous Vegetable Project that builds upon a former uh, program that we had here. And the overall goal is to improve the production and increase consumption of African Indigenous vegetables as an effort to improve nutrition. There's many factors that impact nutrition on a household level, community level that are listed here between access, knowledge, and resources, control over spending. And this project seeks to link horticulture with improved nutrition. The four A's is, is something, it's an AID project, we had to come up with an acronym, so it's access, affordability, availability, and adoption. Adoption could be increased consumption, adoption could be increased production, but without these four A's, we don't have the strength, in, we don't have the strength of the value chain itself. The hypothesis was that appropriate interventions can increase access to and consumption of AIVs amongst producers and consumers, so using groups that were exposed to AIVs in both Kenya and in Zambia then we have a different design where we do different things to look to see if we could change that. Did a pilot survey using IRB approved methods looking at both Kenya and Zambia. This just shows Zambia right now. Imagine what it would be if every day people were eating these types of African indigenous vegetables. Hypothesis would be if we if you lose appropriate promotion and expansion of availability of AIVs and at the local level will strengthen the market access. And here we list the most popular AIVs that are used that are eaten by in each country, which varies. Our project is based in Kenya and in Zambia. Most producers collect their own seeds, and I'll come back to it, rather than buying improved seeds or new quality seeds. We did surveys of over 300 people in both of the different countries in order to look at how they do the practice, what their constraints, how they sell. As listed here, most people will grow AIVs and sell directly to, to the consumers. Reaching wholesalers and others is a very small part of the chain. The availability of these over the course of the year is quite limited as well. The constraints that the growers themselves use, since this is a participatory project, highlights one of the earlier graphs. The one of the limitations that many people have is a lack of seed, and particularly lack of any improved seed quality. So we did a triangulation of the different surveys, surveying producers, surveying intermediaries, and serving household consumption. Once we understand that, and we're beginning to understand that now, since this is only the beginning of our second year of our project, we then identify the best management practice for AIV production to increase capacity. And this uses our market first and science-driven models. One of the key points under this is to first identify whether these AIVs are in fact nu nutritionally rich. So we first we characterize the AIVs, whether they're nutrition rich or not, and then select for those individual lines as they vary on their nutrition. An example here is amaranth. Turns out there's more than 10 million people that consume amaranth on a daily basis. Wouldn't it be nice to introduce the amaranth that both is calcium, magnesium as a high source, or iron as a high source by genotype and across environment to have their stability for the nutritional impact. And that not only has nutrition, but actually through field studies and at grower levels, also have the farmer performance that they need for growers to get good yields as well as market acceptance, combining production, marketing with nutrition. The nutrition, we do, we do this very seriously. This is some, the uh, next series of slides will show amaranth and other types relative to the vitamin content. We look at tocopherol, the vitamin E, four different isomers of tocopherol, carotenoids for provitamin A. We look at the phytochemicals and we look at, of course, the mineral combination. We find that a lot of these AIVs, as you're seeing here, the amaranth, the spider plant, they're much higher than even some of the vegetables that are known to be high, such as spinach over here relative to the vitamin and their other attributes. Nightshade, nightshade is an important product both in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in Southeast Asia. Turns out also to be consumed by millions of people a day. And as you can see in the graph, both the orange and the blue looking at two different vitamins, it's much richer than what is considered to be a rich vegetable. But the issue with some of these plants is they might also have anti-nutrition factors as well. That is the good, the bad, the ugly. And so we, we have a personal responsibility, a person, we have a personal responsibility to look at the alkaloids and other aspects of it. And we find that in the nightshade, the leaves, in fact, are devoid of the alkaloids in the leaves, but they're rich in the fruit. The leaves are very rich in a saponine, which could be bioactive, but in this case, it's very rich in diostenine. That's the precursor to, to the birth control pill, by the way. So looking at the chemicals, we could begin to identify both the high and the good and the bad. Moringa, we're very obsessed with Moringa. We do comparative nutritional studies all over Africa for many years. And this slide shows that from Zambian grown Moringa, it could be considered to be a rich source of iron, magnesium, calcium, and zinc. Three of those to be reported to be low in um, populations within this country as well. 
We use the market models, production models, but it's also based on good science. And this is just in one year of the project, showing a couple papers that are now coming out as a result of the funding that we got from USAID. Um, it's easy for me to talk and brag and be, and be really good because most of the people listed here do most of the work and I get to come to Cambodia to, to enjoy and meet with you. And this is a collaborative project with um, different groups that because it's a speed dating, I can't read them all. So. <laughs> and most importantly, thank you very much to John, to Beth, to Amanda, and to Britta for their support for our program. Thanks.